Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous. With that in mind, we're just going to call him Big Mo. Big Mo, welcome to the show. How you doing, Vic? I'm doing great, but more importantly, how are you? We're hanging in there, Vic. Everything is going on perfect. It's a great night over here in the Big H, and everything is wonderful. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That sure does beat the alternative, doesn't it? It sure does, right? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Mo, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, Vic, I'm from the Big H, Houston, Southern boy. I'm 57 years old. Oh, when this encounter hit me, I was a very, very young 18-year-old PFC in the United States Army. My job that I do right now, I'm an uh, auto body technician. Been doing this for the last 45 years. Pretty good at it. Work at a great company. Um, other than that, just um, and listening to all these uh Dog man, I didn't know anything about a dog man until a friend of mine, Kenny, was uh, telling me about a dog man. I, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> it's kind of funny when, when I heard about it. We had a brief uh, talk when we were out playing golf one day, and uh, I can get into that later as we get into the story. But as far as that, got a beautiful family two boys, two girls, one son is a licensed plumber the other one's a staff sergeant united states marine corps both of my daughters uh, are in uh, education you know they've already got their degrees and have done moved on have beautiful children and uh i'm here at the house with my wife and we're just loving it up and just raising our grandchildren and and just living it up the best we can Vic. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. It sounds to me like it only took you 57 years to carve out a beautiful life for yourself. Yes, sir. Sure enough. Yeah, sounds like it. Your encounter happened 39 years ago. How often do you think about it present day? You know, Vic, it's it's kind of strange that you, you know, that you said that because, you know, no matter what, it can come up in a flash every night. You always think about it. There is never one moment where you don't think about this. It, it's always there. The encounter that I had is welded. It's welded into my memory. It will never be removed. What happened that night was something that I, I am still stumped about. I asked myself many, many times, why me? Why did this happen to me? You know, could have things have been different if I would have maybe not have taken off at that right time or, or, or was there another way we could have uh, taken that we didn't go through this encounter? It was something that it happened and I had to endure what we went through. Fortunately, um, I was uh, young. I guess that that that's what helped out me that night maybe that i was young and i was still open minded should i say you know that that's the thing that probably helped me out vic you know cuz at the time i was still when this happened i was learning from this incident uh my dad had raised champion uh doberman pinchers that were guard dogs he had uh, also the the big line of german shepherds the 125 pounders you know the big police guard dogs my dad had a big body shop and he had the best dogs that protected that shop and compared to even those big dogs that we had 
what I saw that night was nothing in comparison. These things were monsters compared to, to the dogs that, that we had, Vic. Well, like you touched on just a moment ago, the fact that you were open-minded back then, I'm sure that did help you quite a bit. Seems like the eyewitnesses who have the most trouble far and away are the ones that are closed-minded, so no, I think you're onto something there. Without giving us any details from your encounter, how did your encounter affect your ability to function as a soldier? You know, it, it, it wasn't so much that night that it happened. I was in shock. I, I was... I just like I said, I was still in a, in a, in a great deal of shock that, 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 that it happened that night. But being that I had a lot of things to do that night, I was in a position that I had to make sure that the chow got served to the troops out in the field. And we're talking about, a almost a, a full battalion of soldiers that had to get fed, you know? So, I had to keep it together. Now, unfortunately for my first sergeant who was with me during the encounter, it was a different story for him. He wasn't able to make the rest of the trek with me. But at the time, I, I had nobody else to go out after the incident, and I, I had to go back out. I was alone, you know, and uh, I, I had to face what I had to face again. It's just that, thank God that I had more speed where they probably couldn't have caught me or didn't have a chance to, to get near me because I knew exactly where they were at at the time. But as far as my, myself and, and being a soldier, uh, I hung tough in the last year that I was in the military. I would like I said, I was silenced by the military, not to speak of this ever again. So I really couldn't say anything to any, anybody, even, at the the new companies or the new uh, battalions that I was stationed at wherever I had went. So uh, they made sure of that. And that's okay. I had agreed to it and it is what it is. For you to experience an encounter as intense as the one you had and still be able to function effectively as a soldier, that says a lot about your character. From what I understand, your cousins tried to tell you about dogmen that they had seen before you had your encounter. How did you respond when they tried to tell you about their encounters? I didn't believe them. You know, Vic, all my cousins are from the Austin, San Antonio, Gonzalez, Goliad areas, Belton, Temple, Texas. My dad's whole entire family is from that region. And they had mentioned this to me before. You know, they had mentioned this to me, oh, years ago, but before I had went into the military. And at the time, you know, I threw them crazy. What they had called them is that they were oversized wolves. That's what they said. But they said when they used to go out hunting that you didn't mess with them and they didn't mess with you. You know, you kept a safe distance and you did most of your hunting during the day. They never did any night hunting. But there were plenty of times where they had told me about these. My uncles had told me. And, you know, when you're you got to remember, I'm a city boy. I'm from Houston, Texas. The, the most I've ever seen. In Houston, is probably a bull at the rodeo. That's the, probably the biggest thing I've ever seen besides going to the uh, Houston Zoo and looking at an elephant or, or, you know, a rhinoceros in that category. But that in itself is basically just how it goes, Vic. Yeah, well, no one can fault you for responding the way you did. I mean, most people, they would laugh at the idea that something like dogmen could be out there, so... Yeah, it's no surprise you didn't believe him. All right, Big Mo, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. 1980 is the year that this incident happened, but I'm going to go into it just a little bit before. I was 17 years old when I entered the U.S. Army, and uh, the job, or should I call the the MOS, that they assigned me for after we took the test and they figured that this is the best job that you're going to get. They assigned me to is what they call a 63 Fox. And what that is, is what they call a uh, recovery specialist. I took my basic training up in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And it was in the, it was, <laughs> I shouldn't have went in the time I went in, 
it was uh, two days before Thanksgiving. And uh, that was probably the, uh, I, I never knew or I had never ever seen uh, snow in my life. And did I ever find out about the cold up there? Got through uh, basic training and that was uh, 13 weeks. And uh, right after that, we took my, what they call uh, your MOS training, which was in Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland where they give you a recovery specialist. And this is almost a, another eight week course where they show you how to uh, do the job that you're gonna do. Now the the vehicle that I was uh, specialized in was a M578. It's a uh, recovery tank. And what this big tank does, it has a turret on the top of it and it has a crane in the front of it. And it uh, swings around and it can, pick up enormous things that can pull motors out of uh, APCs. And the unit that I was assigned to was a uh, special uh, mechanized infantry that was in uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. But let me get back to where I was at because I'm still in training. Uh, I was there probably for about another maybe uh, eight weeks, graduated out of there, and then I got assigned to my permanent party duty station which is in uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana and uh, did I ever find out about hot weather and the largest mosquitoes that I've ever seen in the world <laughs> but other than that it was a beautiful post, it was nice I got to meet a lot of great friends and the unit that I was in it was all a, a mechanized infantry so what I mean by that Vic is that the infantrymen that would come out of these vehicles were what they call a M114. They're called APCs. And uh, these vehicles carry about six men on one side, six men on the other. And what they would do is that uh, they would, I guess, g go into uh, combat situations. And they had a, a door that would open in the back, a hatch that would open in the back, come down. And, and the guys would come out there and, and ground pound. These were all infantry men. Now, my job was just a uh, recovery specialist. And, and say, for instance, if one of these vehicles broke down or the motor went out or a track went out, my job was to, was to repair these vehicles and get these vehicles back, back to running and get these things back where they were on the road again. That's what my job was. Well, being that, I had just got to Fort Polk and I wasn't probably there maybe two months. The M578 that I was assigned to, it was beat up and broken down and it was just tore up. So uh, they had put in for a, another rebuilt M578 and they ended up sending my vehicle, this big tank, to get it rebuilt. And this was going to take almost about maybe three months. Three months it was going to get taken care of, and that was okay. I was I was happy with that. So at this time, I was just being put on standby. Well, at this time where I was at, I was already probably there, probably my third or fourth uh, month. There was a very large exercise that was being put on in Fort Polk where there were different divisions that were going to be coming to Fort Polk, and they were probably for like, different divisions like from the 101st the first cavalry division the second division out of uh, fort hood the 82nd airborne was also there there was about six or seven big divisions just having like a a big war game or a big war exercise should i say it, and it was going to take almost 30 days 30 to 35 days of being out in the field well i didn't know what was up I was in a headquarters platoon that I was assigned to, and uh, my headquarters sergeant, his name was Sergeant Scott, he comes up to me and four other guys, and he says, uh, he has four straws, and he says, okay, guys, I need y'all to pick straws, and he didn't tell us what the job was for, and uh, I ended up picking the shortest straw, and <laughs> lo and behold, I, I ended up being the driver for my first sergeant, and Nobody wanted this job, and everybody was laughing at me after I knew that I was going to be the first sergeant's driver because he was such a 
mean guy. He was, he was just there. Uh, I guess we had just got him. He had just came over from uh, another battalion or another company, but he was already a, a lifer. I think he had already did 24 years and was just, I think he was liking about another four or five months until he was fixing to retire. Now, all of our first sergeants, Vic, we all call them top. You know, top is always the name, regardless of uh, the first sergeant. They're a, a master sergeant, really is what they are. And they are the, the head uh, sergeant or master sergeant of the whole entire company. And he was a new guy, but he was a very mean guy. You know, I'm, I'm a very small guy myself. At the time, I was almost 5'4", and he was about 5'3". And I still think to this day that this man had a short man complex because uh, he was just a very mean guy. I didn't know what got into him. I, nobody did. Nobody in the company really understood why he was so upset. Maybe something happened when he was over there in Vietnam. I don't know. I, I don't really know what happened. But I know that he just was a mean spirited guy. I can remember that. All the time, you know, he would, uh, I don't know if you ever remember the cartoon uh, uh, Dastardly, where there was a, a little dog named uh, Muttley, and he was always talking to himself. You know, he was always snickering and, you know, always talking to himself. And if you looked at him when he was doing this and he caught you, he would say, well, well what are you looking at? You know, I'd say, nothing, 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 Tom. He would really get upset with you catching the way he was talking to himself. And he would talk to himself all the time, which was, you know, okay. I, I had a couple of uncles who were kind of sideways like that. It came back from a uh, World War II and was kind of the same way. But, you know, to be treated less than anybody else, you know, and always being chewed on for something, you, you know, I could never do anything right for him or always chewing me for something. But, but that was okay. I still hung tough. I did my job. And he knew that no matter what he tried giving me, I was, I was always a yes, sergeant, yes, whatever you want, top, not a problem, top. You know, no matter what he threw at me, I was still there for him, no matter. And uh, it wasn't until that night of the incident that things went awry. But now I'm going to go ahead and put it in perspective where we're just now getting out we're to the field and we're setting up out in the field because this is a big operation and we're just kind of the backup guys we're always staying around the mess hall or the company area around the mess hall because that is our area and we usually did all of our motor pool jobs out in the field if we had to do anything there my job as a driver was to drive is what they call a uh, deuce and a half it is a m35 i believe it is a very large truck it's a cargo truck. They used them a lot in the Vietnam War. Uh, they carried 12 men on one side and 12 men on the other side with some foldable benches that go down on each side. Uh, so that's a, it's a big truck. And it also had a tarp along the top of it. And it had like maybe six rafters that grow across the top of the tarp. Now, the top of the deuce and a half where you're driving at the cab, it also has a, a, a tarp there also. And I'll talk about that later. But me and Top's job was to uh, bring the mess hall food from Garrison or from the company, uh, which was back in Fort Pope. And what we would do is we would give the... Uh, soldiers out in the field two hot meals a day they would get breakfast and then they would get dinner which was, um, or supper at night so that means that we were traveling in the morning at three o'clock we would leave out and then we would also leave out at 3 30 in the evening this was consistent every day until the operation was over our job was to go back to the battalion mess hall pick up the food, and the, usually what they would give us are uh, maybe 10 containers, these aluminum containers, and inside these containers, there were three smaller containers, and these things would carry whether it was, say for instance, if it was breakfast, it would be uh, cream beef, or it would be 
uh, scrambled eggs or they would be pork chops or they would have pancakes were made or whatever it was, eggs, different ma- ways, sausage. It was just different food that were put in these containers. And our job was to get these containers and drive back out to the field, which was almost 35 miles. And we would do this twice a day. Now, the evening times, we would leave at almost 3.30 in the uh, evening, and uh, we would pick up the food and then also top off the vehicles. I was pulling uh, also is what we called a water buffalo. It's a big tank of uh, water that the uh, soldiers used to fill up their five-gallon water jugs or their canteens. They call it a water buffalo. And I would usually park that out where the company mess hall was. And I would usually have to take that back every two days because they they really went through a lot of water when they were out there. Now, also, the amount of food that we carried out there was an enormous amount of food. If it was in the evening, we would be bringing all chicken, pork chops, you name it. These guys were fed the best. Cakes. I mean, cakes, when they brought you out cakes, these cakes were in these trays that were at least four by four feet. And there was probably at least uh, four or five of them stacked. There would be different cakes. And and then we'd also carry the igloos, which were about six different igloos with different punches and milks and coffees. It didn't matter. But our job was to transport chow back and forth. Now, the incident that happened, the encounter that happened, we were probably already four or five days there. And I never heard nothing. I never saw nothing on the way in to where the mess hall was at in the field from the hardball. And the hardball, when I say the hardball, is uh, what we usually call the two-lane road that they use for the, whether it's the tanks or the cars that go in there because there's a lot of ranchers that have property out there that i guess let the military uh use their properties so that they can do these big field exercises and it's not a problem the company mess hall in the field was probably about three miles in from the two-lane hard top was at uh blacktop or it was just like i said we used to call it the hardball so we were all the way into the the mess hall and uh it was just a regular normal night and uh i think it was a a wednesday night if i'm not mistaken it was wednesday night and it was 3 30 in the morning and my first sergeant says uh, okay let's go so next thing i knew I had to go over there i had already loaded up all the uh containers from the mess hall because what the mess sergeant would have me do after they would finish serving chow I had to bring back all the containers. I would also take back all the trash that was to be taken back and put those in the dumpsters once I got back. I would take back all the uh, igloos, and and if the water buffalo had to be refilled, well, I had to load that back up, and it wasn't a big deal. Anyway, I I didn't have to bring the water buffalo home, but I did have eight of the aluminum containers on board with me, and I had four trays and I had a lot of food. The, some of the soldiers were out, uh, I guess, doing maneuvers. So a lot of the uh, soldiers didn't get to eat that night. So there was a lot of food that was left over. And it was just another night, Vic, just another night that me and my first sergeant had to hit the road and go back to Garrison or, or back to the company mess hall when this incident happened. And it was 3.30. I can remember it was hot it was very hot at night i can remember the moon was shining bright it was shining very bright and we're going down the road and you got to remember in these field operations you're not allowed to have your lights on at night anytime it's a field operation or an exercise like that you had to have your lights off and and that's when they call a, a night light mode so uh, there's a switch on your deuce and a half and you have to put on light mode. And the, you've only got these two little bitty small lights that shine on where you can just barely make out the road. So the most we're probably doing is maybe 
10 miles an hour, just tr- drudging along, making sure that, because you, you have to really train your eyes in order to see what's in front of you. Thank God I had this, uh, before this first sergeant was assigned, I had another first sergeant who taught me, he was a 17-year Green Beret, and he taught me how to look at night and to train your eyes at night to really look very, very focused at night. He said, you can almost see everything as if it's almost like day, you know? And I didn't, at first I I questioned him about that. And he says, no, you have to really, really train yourself. And I did. It took me almost three or four nights to do it, but, but he was right. I was able to almost get that truck up to about maybe 10, 15 miles an hour before, you know, top would say, slow down slow down you're going too fast i can't say what you're doing you know but i I knew what i was doing so anyway we're probably about maybe um two miles out from the mess hall we're coming back and it's 3 30 in the morning we're coming back and we're going back to garrison to to take back all the containers back so that we can load back up for the morning breakfast now as we're getting probably about maybe a mile and a half before the hardball, my first sergeant says, pull over. I need to take care of some business. So I pulled over. All right, Tom, no problem. I pulled over. And uh, he opens the door. And I think he, he goes back to use the restroom, relieve himself on the on the rear back tire. And uh, he kept the door open. And... Both of our windows, I can remember both of the windows being down because Top was a, a smoker. He would light one cigarette up and, and right off the bat, he would smoke another one, Vic. He was just one of those guys that would just constantly smoke, smoke after smoke after smoke, and which was really, really was killing me to tell you the truth, but I really couldn't tell him that without getting chewed out. Other than that, he was using the restroom and out in the field to the right of me, I could see something out there making a, a some type of noise, like a, you know, like a, I don't know, like maybe sound like air brakes going off, Vic. It sounded like, and but it was consistent. It was consistent. And I was asking my first sergeant, I said, "Top, you hear that?" And he didn't. He didn't reply. He didn't say nothing back to me. And. And I was looking out there and, you know, and, and back then, uh, Vic, in the military, they give you, you're assigned these uh, little flashlights that look like a 90 degree flashlight and they don't give you much light. I think you can probably, the most you're going to be able to see is probably 20 feet with your flashlight on if you had a good pair of, of batteries in there. But I shined it over there in the field and I could see, oh, there had to be at least eight little lights. There was eight little lights over there and I could see something and I could tell top. I said, top, I said, do you hear that? And he still doesn't hear me. I guess he's urinating on the tire and, and he's over there talking to himself. I could hear him over there mumbling like he always does. And he's over there talking to himself and he's smoking a cigarette at the same time he's relieving himself. And he also has his M16 strapped across his back. So I'm looking at the field and I got my flashlight. I'm looking over there to say, what in the world's going on over there? And at this time, Vic, I see something just start barreling. I'm talking about barreling, and it is mowing down trees, brush, shrubs. It didn't matter what was in the way. And I thought, I thought it was a big bull. I, I said, what? could be coming that fast making that type of a noise and and it's probably now it's probably oh it probably now it's probably I'd probably say 30 feet 30 feet from where it was now it's probably got about another 60 to 75 feet i know 75 yards before it gets to us now i'm telling top i said top and i'm getting louder now so i said top i said do you see that do you do you hear that and he's still now he's getting mad at me saying, whoop. And I, I don't want to repeat what he said, but he said, what, what, what are you saying? You know, I said, Top, I said, there's something in the field coming. And he still doesn't, he still doesn't, he doesn't mind me, but he's got a cigarette. And what he does, he turns around, Vic, 
and I'm kind of looking at him at a, at a sideways a little bit because uh, uh, I'm kind of poking my head out out to out the door where he's at, and I'm saying, I said, Top, do you see that? I said, something's on. By that time, he turns, he turns around, and he throws his cigarette. You know how you throw a cigarette like you thump a cigarette? Vic, uh, you know, like you throw it like a, uh, like where you're kicking a little football, like, like if you're, uh, kicking a, um, a little paper football, like you, you know, how you kick a cig, you know, that's what smokers do. They can throw that cigarette and, and it flew. It probably flew about, oh, 15, 20 feet. And you know how it lands, you know, it, it looks like a little, uh, firecracker, the flame, you know, like the, all the, the cigarette ends just bursted into like a little flame. Not, not, a, not so much a flame, but like a little flicker. I saw that and I saw my first sergeant. All I could hear him say was, go, go, go. So at this time, I see him and I think he slipped first because he tried to get some traction. And I think he's zipping up his pants and threw it the cigarette at the same time. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, 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 at, the, at first, I thought it was kind of funny because he, you know, he was such a, he, he, he had already fell and he was trying to get back to his feet. And I forgot to mention this, Vic, is that he wore these big Coke bottle uh, glasses. Back then in 1980, they didn't have the great glasses that they have now, like progressive glasses, you know, and the, the real small, thin glasses. No, these were some really super thick glasses. And poor guy. You know, he tried getting into the truck. Well, now I already cranked this truck up, and and I don't know if anybody knows this about a deuce and a half. Well, you got like this granny gear that's uh, in first gear, and it's and it's really made to climb when you're in the ditches or you're in a really uh, high or going up a hill or something. You put that thing into that low gear, and then you go to second gear, which is really a lot of guys say that's first gear. But anyway. As he's saying, go, 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 I had already busted off of first gear, and I was tearing up some dirt. I was tearing up the rocks. Now, the, the road that we're on, it was these uh, red, brown rocks. They're kind of like a big, I, I wouldn't say like a limestone, but they're like a big brownish rock that were just all the way from probably from where the hardball was at, probably maybe a a mile before they stopped and before we had to go into dirt to, to get back to the mess hall. But I was getting it, Vic. I was already in second gear. Now, my first sergeant is trying to get in. Now, he's trying to get into the truck and he slips on this step and he, he throws his M16 on the floorboard of the, of the deuce and a half. Now, I could see he is struggling. So I lend my hand out. I pull my hand off the off the gear shifter, and I leaned it out to him. And he grabs my arm, and he's trying to he's trying to get in the best he can because he's he's all over the place. His glasses have done fell off. He's a world of a mess, and I don't know what he saw. All I saw was what appeared once he was trying to shut the door. Now whatever was there had placed their hand had placed the hand in between the door jam of the of the truck and the door now when top shut that door all i heard was a howl all i heard was a howl a scream whatever it was it was noise it it, it i felt it almost broke my eardrums but i didn't see this i didn't see it but whatever he it happened he had smashed the man. I, now I can call it a dog, man, because I didn't know what it was then. I thought it was just an oversized uh, wolf that had drank some uranium or something. But it had placed its hand there. Top had shut that door on it. And Vic, you may not believe me what I'm telling you right to this day, but that dog, man, opened that door with the other hand that it had. I am not kidding you. Now, when it it was smart enough to open that door is where I tried telling Top. I said, Top, shut the door and throw the, the lock down. I said, put the door handle down. That way it locks it and you can't get in. He didn't, he didn't know this because he was going back and forth 
with this dog man. This dog man is trying to open the door and they're trying to go back and forth. Now, at this time, after the dog man had already got his hand, I guess, crushed, he's trying to, to grab on to, to the mirror. Now, on a deuce and a half, we've got these really large mirrors that stick out. It places its its hand, uh, not the hand that, that got smashed, but he put its hand on the mirror, and it tried to step on the, uh, there's a step there that you step onto, and I guess it slipped off to, because it, it didn't matter, it didn't matter. It was running with us, Vic. This big old thing was running. Now, I didn't really see the head, until it came up, it came up, and it's now right next to Top. And Top, now Top is trying to find his glasses, and he's looking back. And when he finally gets his glasses back on him, he's looking at this dog man. Vic, I cannot tell you how large this this thing's head was. This dog man's head was the entire size of the full window from nose to the back of the ears or should i say not not the not the mane or or the back of the hair from the ears it took up the entire window vic that's how large this head was and let me talk about mad and angry. This thing had to have canines that were at least three inches long. And it was getting its point across by, by chomp. It, it was just steadily snapping, snap, just tight, 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 tight. It was snapping at top. Now, top is trying to stay his distance from it. And, and, and now in order for this thing to hold on uh, to the, with its other hand, it puts its hand, it puts the other talons or, or claws or whatever straight through the top of the tarp uh, on the cab. It just put him right through there. It put him right through there as if it was hot butter. Now it's got a real good, uh, now it's really hanging on because it's hanging on from the mirror and it's hanging on through the top of the cab. Now I'm over here trying to go from, from, from second. And I'm trying to get this thing to go into third. At this time, Vic, this thing looks at top. And it goes off with this half bark, half yell, half scream. Which was, it, it vibrated my chest. My it vibrated the entire cab when it howled. It was so loud, Vic. I thought that it broke my eardrums because I couldn't hear it. It it's as if you you know when you hear a, a large explosion and it goes there. Beep. Well, that's what I had heard after it had it had did this. Now I'm gonna tell you how loud this thing was. My first sergeant passed out. My first sergeant passed out. And what happened is that he slumped over and he fell on my hand and the shift gear. So now I'm in third and I'm trying to get to fourth, but I can't get to fourth because he's on top of me and the shift gear. Now I'm trying to tell top, top, get up, get up, top, move, top, get up. Now this thing is still st steadily there just steadily just chomping after he yells this this bark or this yell it must have yelled for about it felt like oh man um maybe 30 seconds of just a i don't want to say you know how, how these young fellows nowadays got these these train horns it was it, it was so loud it was so loud and like i said i i don't know how how i was still even able to to drive you know and at the same time I, I, i'm in i'm in second going trying to get to third i'm trying to to to, to move the the deuce and a half where where i can 
you know, shake them off or get them off the side of this big old truck. But he, it's nothing to him. He's hung on this thing like a monkey on a banana. You know, I can't shake this thing for nothing, Mick. He is on me. Now, just as, and I still don't know to this day why I looked to the left. I looked to the left just for just a smidge of a sec because I thought that I had heard something hit the window or something had placed something on the window. And what it was, it was another female dog man who had placed her hand on the window of my driver's side now. Now I am looking at this female and I can tell she's a female because you could tell that that she had breast. You could tell that that she and she is keeping up with the truck. And I figure at this time I'm doing at least 35 and I'm trying to do get it into 40. If I can get this thing out of third and going into four. But top is laying on top of me like a big and he's out. He's passed out from this thing that just howled and just screamed. And and I'm really now focusing on this female dog man. Now, what was so captivating, Drick, and this this is what totally blew my mind today, and it, and I don't know why this happened. But this female dog man, she looks at me. And I can remember her, her the the uh, at her ears, her ears, Vic, were almost at. They weren't at a ninety degree angle, Vic. They weren't perfectly standing straight up. They were just a little bit cocked backwards. They were just a little bit. And she is looking at me. She is looking at me, and she's kind of and I, she's trying to tell me something telepathically. What you know, she's trying to give me something. Uh, like mind telepathy, should I say? She's trying to tell me, like, chill out, be cool. Everything's going to be all right. Everything is going to be okay. Vic, she didn't even open her mouth. I seen the canines, and there were at least probably two and a half, three inches, but her mouth was shut, Vic, and she's keeping up with the truck. Now, you got to remember, all, all I hear from her is the gate. Of her, of her, uh, of her feet, of and, and really, what when I looked down to see her, it looked like she had kind of rabbit feet. You know, they were so. You know, you know how rabbit uh, got. You know, the haunches kind of. They were so large that you know, but they were just huge. They were just big, but she was keeping up with the gate, and I can remember just chang, chang, chang. Chang, 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 just keeping them. And those are her claws. That's what she's hitting the rocks with. And I can remember the gait that she is running with. She is just running at a beautiful pace. Now, what I can remember so vividly, Vic, are her eyelashes. I could see her eyelashes, Vic. And she's looking at my eyes. You know how? How when a woman kind of looks at you and they close their eyes very slowly, like, you know, captivating, slow down, take it easy. And she really has me captivated. She has me paying really a lot of attention to her. Now, at this same time, she looks at me and her demeanor totally changes. Now her ears are going back and now I'm looking back and forth at the road and I'm trying to keep going. And at this time, Vic, night lights, I, I didn't even worry about night lights. I turned on the lights and, and, and that, and th I didn't care about who, what, what military operation was going on. I was turning on my lights and I was going to get out of there as fast as I could. Night lights. I didn't care about no light lights. I had them headlights on and I, and I was getting out of there, Vic. Now, I still have this female dog, man, and I can see her, and I can see her demeanor has now changed. Her ears went from the position they were, 
And now they are all the way back, Vic. And now she's trying to keep focus with me. But now I feel the back of the truck as if somebody has just landed in the back truck as if I'll probably figure a thousand pounds just landed in the back of the truck. Something has just landed in the back of my truck. Something has gotten the back of the, of the deuce and a half. So while this female is got me captivated over here, this other dog, man, that was over there tantalizing my first sergeant, it done went from the right side and it done jumped in the back of the deuce and a half. And what it did, it starts throwing out. It took it, Vic. It tore the entire tarp. It tore the rafters clean off. Well, I guess with the talons or the nails that it had, it ripped that entire tarp off the back of this truck. I'm talking about it took out the rafters. It broke the sides. It just tore up everything. Now it threw six. It was six of those containers out. Six of those containers out. I had to answer for those containers. That'll get that'll get right down the story. Now, at this time, I am looking back at this female, and I can see her demeanor is changing now. She has went from this beautiful looking dog, man, into now a vicious dog. But I can see she's not looking at me. She is looking at Top. Top has now awoken from his funk or whatever he was in. And he comes up with his M16 and points it at this thing. Now, mind you, we have no live rounds. We have no ammunition. This fool goes out and aims this M16 at this dog man with no nothing in it. But I guess that, I guess he was just in that much fear, I guess maybe he must have thought that that was the right thing to do. But as I look back and I seen her that she was fixing to probably break that window. Oh, good Lord. I thought she was going to break that window. Right? I thought she was going to come through there and get me. I thought she was going to come get me and before she was going to get top. But anyway, I, I grabbed Tops M16. I, I I get my hands off the shift gear. I grab Tops M16 and I lower it. I lower it and he is in shock. Vic, he is in shock. He doesn't know. He 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 is just in shock. I lower the weapon down. I look back to the left because I'm thinking this old dog man is fixing to rip me. Vic, when I looked there, she was gone. She was gone. The dog man was gone in the back. I guess they had, I don't know, maybe they signaled to each other. We got it. You know, but I could tell that in her mind, she told me, she said, you know, this is what she was, this is what I was taking in from her. Slow down. Everything's going to be okay. We're hungry. That's what I was getting. Now, I couldn't tell you that for sure, but I know one thing. They sure got the rest of all that chow that I was going to take back to the mess hall. Now, Top is a mess. My first sergeant is a mess. He is a mess. He has already done defecated on himself. He has already done urinated on himself. He is a hot mess. And he is just crying. He is compulsively crying you know he was just he was a he was a bad shape he was in real bad shape and he asked me and he pleaded with me he said please please you know after all this cussing and all this being mean to me Vic he told me please don't say nothing don't say nothing about this don't say nothing and he doesn't understand I have to go back to the mess hall and I have to, I have to go, go deal with the mess sergeant and say, uh, well, I don't have your containers, sergeant. You know, I don't, I, I, what am I supposed to sell? So I get back, we get back to the company and he has me drop them off right in front of the company. 
I've never drove, ever drove in a deuce and a half on, on front of the company. You know, we always go to the back of the company where we're supposed to drive. But he had me drop him off in the front. I come out there and my lieutenant runs out. And he, G is jumping all over my butt. What are you doing driving this? I said, Lieutenant Miley. I said, he told me. He told me, drive it up here. He is trying to ask top top. He doesn't, he just runs by because he, he is now trying to find out information and he wants to know what's going on. And I, I don't know whether I should do what my first sergeant said and don't say a word, but I had, no, I have to say something because he sees the deuce and half tore up. And what they thought is they thought that I ran up under some trees. They thought that I tore up this deuce and half, which was just, we had just got this deuce and half. It was just rebuilt. In other words, it was a brand new rebuilt deuce and a half. It was probably three weeks old, Vic. And just to see it tore up like that, man, they sure weren't happy with me. But I explained to them. I explained to my, I, I told my lieutenant, I said, Lieutenant, sir, I said, a couple of big wolves attacked us. And he laughed at me. He said, I'm going to ask you again. What happened out there? I said, sir. I said, you can go in there and you can ask Top. You can ask Top. They tried to knock on Top's uh, office door, and he wouldn't answer. He wouldn't answer. I guess Top called his wife, uh, from what they told him. He called his wife, and he went home. He went home. Can you believe that? He went home on me. So now I have to answer to everybody. I have to answer to the mess sergeant. I have to answer to the lieutenant because they have an OIC. He, he was the OIC that was in the in the uh, uh, the company. They always leave an OIC and a and a uh, an NCO that's always there at the company. No matter even if well, there are field operations going on, somebody always has to maintain uh, the company perimeter. Always, that's always. Right? And I'm trying to tell my lieutenant. I said, sir. I said, I'm trying to tell you the truth. I, and 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 there is nobody else to help me collaborate with my story. So now I'm a mess myself, but I know that I have to get that chow, that morning breakfast back out to those soldiers for morning, for morning chow. So I drive back through, I drive the truck around, back up to the mess sergeant, back to the mess hall. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Vic, I forgot to mention. After this incident had happened, I had to stop the vehicle about three, but maybe two, three miles after we got on the hardball. Because what happened is that I was dragging the entire tarp that this dog man had tore off, rafters and all, and was dragging. I was dragging it on the road. I could see that. So what I ended up doing, I stopped the truck and he didn't want me to stop. He, 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 he said, if you stop this thing, he said, I'll have you court martial. I said, sir, I said, I've got to get this stuff. I said, we left those things, I said, at least three or four miles back. I said, you don't have to worry. I said, let me just stop this truck. I said, let me put these things back in the truck. And he was, he, he didn't want to have it, but I had to do my job. I stopped the truck. I put everything back. What, what was left of the tarp, the rafters. I got back in the truck and we made it back to, to like I said, we made it back to the company. And that's where that part went before I had to go and see the, the mess sergeant. Now I go to the mess sergeant and I said, uh, sergeant, I don't have your containers. I said, I said, you may not believe me. I said, but we were attacked by some big wolves, wolves that were run, that were, that were standing running on their two feet, back two feet. And he doesn't believe me. He said, come on now. He said, you're going to come off with some stuff like that. He said, I need my containers. He said, I need to get y'all to y'all's child. I said, he said, Mo, he said, Lord, that, them, I said, I need my, some containers. He said, I got this breakfast already hot. He said, I've got to load them up. He said, I got to get you going. I don't know what to tell him, Vic. I don't know. What to tell. And I told him, I said, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I'm telling you what I'm telling you, man. I said, this beast got into the back of them and they threw out the containers. I'm telling you straight up. I'm trying to be straight with you. But no. 
They don't want to hear it. So, anyway, I said, look, I said, Sarge, I said, I've got to go top off. Now, as soon as I topped off, I had to do my PMCSs, which is called a preventive maintenance check service, where you go out there and make sure your oils are up, all your operations are up. So I had to make sure that the vehicle was, was roadworthy to get back on the road. I ended up having to take the tarp off, take off all the broken rafters off, and I drove it back to the motor pool, and I put them right there because I had a key to the motor pool. And uh, I opened up our bay door, and I put everything in there. And when I went back to my lieutenant, he says, you have destroyed this deuce and a half. And I tried to say, I said, sir, I said, I'm trying to tell you, man. I'm trying to tell you that there was a big old dog. And, and he saw that the, the window had been broke on the right side. And I forgot you mentioned that, Vic, that the, the dog, man, had also broke the, the window on the on the passenger side as it was trying to get to my first sergeant. They were he was trying to pull the window down and my first sergeant's trying to roll it up. This big old beast could have easily, easily snatched him right out of there with one hand. Its arms had to have been at least six feet, six feet the, the, the chest on this dog man that I saw that was running next to us looked like a 55 gallon drum if not bigger when it was running on the side of us Vic this thing and was bending down now a deuce and a half is almost 8 feet tall it's a little bit I think it's about maybe 8 feet 2 inches if I'm not mistaken 111 inches it's, it's, it's a big truck now this thing was bending down both of them was the female that was on my side was also bending down and running next to me both of these had to have been at least nine feet easy easy but i know it's the one on the right had to have been them because that was a male that one looked a lot bigger than this female it was a monster now i'm back at the motor pool i end up topping off my vehicle doing my preventer, make sure I did everything I was supposed to, close up the bay door, and I'm going back out, and I'm trying to tell my first lieutenant, I said, sir, I've got to have a TC. I've got to have somebody go out there with me. But you're on your own. I said, on my own, sir? Now, I figured I could either do two things, Vic. I could either wait a little while and wait till maybe the sun comes up. And I said, no, I can't do that. I said, I know I've got to be there at a certain time. So anyway, the mess sergeant, he goes out there and he says, I want my eight containers. He said, no, I want my six containers back. He says, you signed for them. I said, yes, sir. I said, I'll, I'll try to do my best to get them back. I could care less about those containers, Vic. <laughs> I really could. I didn't give what a hoot about the containers. Anyway, my first lieutenant had already radioed my captain which was out in the field about what had happened and what happened to the first sergeant. So I load back up. I get all the food back in there. I get all the breakfast, hot coffee, orange juice, everything that has to go back out to feed this battalion. And there's only one way in and one way out, Vic, where we had this encounter. The only thing is, it was a straight way, but there's also a left-hand turn right there where my first sergeant had urinated. It was kind of a, a turn right there. So I knew that if I had, if I was going to go through there, I had to be, be doing at least 35, 40 miles an hour to hold that turn, make sure that I didn't go spilling anything in the back and make sure that I was still, you know, able to control that deuce and a half so that I didn't flip it or, 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 or or end up on the side of the road or something like that. But anyway, I had also forgot to mention, Vic, that when we stopped on the side of the road when my first sergeant had asked me to pull over, there was a barbed wire fence. And I guess the, maybe the ranchers had put them up for the, and maybe they must have had cattle out there. I, I never saw any, but I know that there were barbed wire uh, 
uh, all the way. It was a, and the barbed wire was almost, uh, I'd probably say f four and a half, maybe five feet. Now, whatever this dog man did, it had to have jumped that entire barbed wire because I, I, I never saw it. I never saw it. I never heard it jump. All I know is that it was right there on, on my first sergeant's, on his tail, you know. I didn't know if it had grabbed his leg. I didn't know if it had uh, 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 cut him. I don't know if it did, did anything. But I know that when my first sergeant shut it on his hand that first time, it broke three of the the claws. It broke three of the claws. And there was probably about maybe a, a half inch half inch of one of them on two of them but the but the biggest one was probably about maybe an inch and a half uh think about maybe an inch and a half so that was the only thing that helped me collaborate with the story besides the blood that that had came off on the uh, uh the nails and and also the window that had broke when i told my when i got back out to to the mess hall because when i got there my captain had ordered me Get over here now, emergency right now. When I went and seen my captain, he he the same thing. I want to know what happened. And I told him, I told him exactly what happened. So he goes out there and and as a matter of fact, they had uh, two or three captains that came out there and looked at the truck. They saw that uh, whatever that what that had stepped on the side of the step. The side of the step that was on my first sergeant's side had to have laid, at least weighed a thousand pounds, because it it totally it, that step is a pretty sturdy step, Vic. I mean, you can put an easily a um, eight hundred pounds on it. It ain't gonna, you know, ain't gonna bend. But I know that that thing was almost all the way down to to the ground. They thought that I wrecked it. They thought that I hit a tree with it. And I was trying to tell them, I said, I did not hit nothing, sir. They saw that the mirror was bent down and they, they thought I hit a tree. They thought that I tore the whole, the whole back. They, they thought that I went up under a low lying trees and it took a while for them to understand, uh, what really happened. And my first, thank goodness, it took two days before my first sergeant. I don't know what what he what kind of strings he pulled. I don't know what he pulled or how he pulled it, but I know I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble big time. If 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 it wouldn't have been for him coming clean, and I guess he must have talked to somebody that was way up there in brass because they sent some guys out there and 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 they came out and they talked to me. It must have been two, three days later. But I swear, Vic, for almost two days, I went through a, a lot of scrutiny because they thought I was lying. They thought that this never happened. You know, and, and, and you know, and I could, uh, I see at the time, I, uh, I couldn't understand why they wouldn't believe me. I was just a PFC, but my record was clean. It was, it was uh, exemplary. I had never been in no trouble. I was a, I was a straight shooter. I did exactly what I was told, and and that's what they knew about me. So they knew that that I was a good guy, and but they said, just tell us what really happened, and I and I tried to tell them, and you know, and and my my captain even told me. He said, well, well, why don't you show me where these things are at? I said, sir, I'm not going back out there. I said, I'm not going back out there. I said, you're not going back out there without some type of of live rounds. I'm not going back out there, sir. You know, I, I, I would, I'm not going to do it. I, I, I'll tell you where it's at. I'll show you where it's at. I said, I'll even run by there and show you, but I will not stop there. I, I said, I'm not going to do it, sir. I said, I've done seen what's out there and I can't do it. I said, what's out there is going to get you too. <laughs> and they, they really thought I was a nut. <laughs> they, they actually thought I was really joking with them. I couldn't believe it. But Vic, I mean that that is the true skinny that that would have happened until the you know the men in black had came out, and that was when a uh, four 
military uh, black suburbans had drove up. And uh, I can remember this as if it was yesterday. I was there sitting in the truck because, you know, when, when during the day, you, I, I've really got nothing to do but just wait on, on, on my, myself to go get chow and, and, and to go, you know, make sure that I'm cleaning up, policing up the area, you know, making sure that, I, you know, I'm, I'm making sure that the water buffalo is taken care of, making sure I, I bag up all the trash, making sure that I put it, you know, in the truck, you know, making sure that making sure I do my daily job. And when these guys showed up, these four guys, these four trucks showed up, they were clean. They were beautiful trucks. You know, you would have never expected them to be, you know, out where we were. And the first thing they did, they came and got me. And I can remember everybody looking at me. And they put me inside of a Suburban and started, gave me about 90 questions. What happened? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? How did it happen? And uh, they took over from there. They cleared me of everything to do with the truck. They went to my captain. And they said, don't worry about that truck. We're going to get everything, you know, taken care of on the truck. Whatever was taken or, or whatever's gone, we're going to replace. Don't worry about nothing. Now, what they wanted to know was who I talked to, what I told anybody. Anybody that I had told was had to, had to be debriefed. Everybody that I had mentioned anything to had to be debriefed. So I guess everybody got debriefed and was said that none of this had ever happened. And that's just the way it was. And that's the way it was. <laughs> that's funny how it happens. But they asked me, these guys that came out of these trucks, these guys were just not no regular guys. These guys were suited up to do some damage. I can remember back then in the 80s, they had those uh, military Uzis, you know, and they were all packing those. They had all kind of uh, machineries, uh, looked like a, some kind of a, a radar machine that they used. Now, they were pointing when we got back out to where them little uh, dog men were at, and they were hunting, I guess they're hunting down. And, and no matter what I would ask them, they never gave me an answer back. I could ask them two or three times, well, what are they? why are they? Who are they? Now, they, they just said the same thing. You asked too many questions. So I figured, you know, who are you? Who are you to tell me? I almost got killed by these things, you know? And the same, and the same, they kept giving me the same thing. They said, well, they didn't kill you, did they? I said, no. I said, but they could have. They said, but did they? I said, no. I said, but they could have. And that went on for a while. I, would, I just wanted some answers, Vic. You know, is it too much to get some answers? I mean, I went through a, a nightmare. I went through a, a, a travesty over here. But you know what? They don't see it like that. And it was a good thing, Vic, that one of them was, I think, I believe it was a, a lieutenant colonel. He came up to me. He pulls me in there and he says, look, he says, I understand you're frustrated. You're angry. You're upset. You want answers. He says, but you're not going to get them. He said, these things have been around for a long time. He says, we need them as much as we need you. He told me this and, and he said, what really puzzled me, he says, there are things out there that these things have to take care of. He says, you don't know anything about it. He says, it's none of your business. He said, but that's all I'm going to give you. He said, if that will satisfy you, he says, well, then that's all you're getting. He says, until then, he says, you'll make no, you won't say another word about it. And that's just it. And I said, yes, sir. He says, as far as everything else that, that happened, you know, it never happened. Well, I had kept those claws or those, that towel and that, that it broke off. And I don't know how word got around that somebody said that I had them, but they showed up. They showed up <laughs> and they said, we want them. <laughs> and I knew exactly what they were talking about. I had them wrapped up in a handkerchief in a little box inside my room. I said, you talking about these? He said, yep. He said, are you sure that's it? I said, yes, sir. He said, we don't want to, he says, we don't want to come out here again. I said, I don't have anything else. I said, but think about it. I said, nobody believed my story. Nobody believed me. I said, you know how many times I got laughed at? 
He said, I understand. He said, I, we, we get it. We get it. But, uh, Vic, that's my story. And, uh, that's how it went that crazy night. Crazy doesn't even begin to describe it. No, wow. no. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Oh my God. And it, I had even forgot to mention Vic, when I got back to the mess hall, you know, not only did my, my first sergeant defecate and urinate all over himself, I also urinated. And I didn't even know. I didn't even know that I did. I, I didn't notice until my, until my mess sergeant told me. He said, man, what, what, what'd, you, what'd you do, man? I said, man, I said, you wouldn't believe what I went through, sergeant. I said, you would not believe what I went through. I said, I, you know, and, and I tried to explain to him what happened. And and they they all laughed at me, you know. They said, man, you just went up there and then and this that you know. Every one of them said, you just tore that old truck up. You must have hit something. You and you're not telling us the real deal. I said, oh yeah, I'm telling you the real deal, buddy. I'm I'm telling you straight skinny on it. I, I to this day don't know why, Vic. I I don't know if I could have did something different if my first and I still blame this I still blamed it on my first sergeant for asking us to stop you know we talked about uh, uh two months after uh because well, I, I didn't see him I didn't see you know he, he he got taken away for about maybe about a month I guess he he had to go get some uh psychiatric work done but he finally came back and you know all that mean-spirited being real honorary to me and cussing me out all the time you know he he stopped all that Vic he came over there and he told me he said he said I would have never made it out of there without you and she said when you pulled your hand out he says and I grabbed your arm he said that thing had my boot he said but he said uh, uh if you wouldn't have pulled me in you know and, and took off at the right time because I you know I was getting it Vic when I was when I left when I was pulling him in I had I had that thing I had it going. I, I'm talking about I had them wheels spinning, and I was getting out of there. I was just hoping that that I could get him inside that truck. And 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 poor thing, you know, he. I didn't realize it. Sometimes, Vic, when you're just so mean and ornery, you miss out on life. You 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 miss out on being just being a nice guy, you know. And I know how he felt when he came back. And he apologized to me. He he said it in in, in subtle words, you know, uh, but I understood. And I told him, I said, it's all right, Todd. I said, me and you went through this together. I said, the thing is, is that nobody, nobody can tell us what happened that night. Nobody. But it is what it is. And uh, I'm here. I'm alive. And I thank God every day that I'm here and I'm here to tell this story, to tell this about this encounter. A lot, a lot of people, <laughs> they don't, they don't believe me. You know, I, I made the mistake, Vic, of telling my sons, my sons, you know, my, my own blood, you know, and they, they made fun of me, you know, my own boys. Ain't that something? I, dog, I couldn't believe it. I said, son, I said, I'm, I'm being dead honest, serious with you. But that's okay. You know, they didn't see it. They never saw it. So that, that's okay. I get it. I understand. But I guarantee you one thing, Vic. If they were to have seen one, I can guarantee it. They'd say, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry we mistaked you. I'm sorry that we... we 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 were we were funning with you, cause I tell you what, Vic, it it hurts, it really hurts, you know, when your own babies don't believe you. I know it hurts me, but you know, get, getting back to people who have helped me, my friend Kenny, what happened is that really I would have never knew about you, Vic, if it wouldn't have been for Kenny. We were really it started when we were playing golf, and my ball ended up going into the woods a little bit. And and it doesn't matter, Vic. I don't I don't care because me and Kenny we go out and we play golf at at some places sometimes sixty seventy miles away from Houston. And I pack I pack two forties, 
I pack 240 Smith and Wessons in my golf bag and I pack extra rounds. I pack two extra clips in my golf bag. I'm not joking with you. I will not be in a situation ever again like that. And believe me, Vic, I will never, ever, ever try if I can, if I can get away from them and not bring violence to the situation, I'm going to do that. And I would, I would advise anybody out there to do that. Reason, reason with these things, reason with them and, and, and do not use firepower unless it is the last resort until they have put hands on you or until they have, they have drew first blood then you probably have every right in the world to unload any type of artillery you want on these. But I knew when that female spoke to me, I knew that she was hungry. And I knew that they knew that that truck, that my truck was going back and forth with that child. It just so happened to be that we just ended up parking at the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, they, and they knew that what we, what we had in there was food and a lot of food, Vic. I mean, we still could have fed close to, I'd probably say another 300 soldiers with as much food as we had left that hadn't been eaten that night for, for night chow. So I knew that they were hungry. They had to have been hungry because she, she had, she had telepathically told me, you know, which I'm not trying to say she was saying, you know, hey, uh, uh, this is like McDonald's. Hey, we're hungry. No, no. What, what she was telling me was just be cool, be calm. And that's what I felt that the way that that, that she laid them eyes. And, and I can remember her eyelashes and the whiskers on her. And I could tell that she was uh, if, if she wasn't tan then she might have been maybe a gray, uh, but but I know that she was a light color. I could say that. Now, that other one, the other mean one, the right one, the right hand, he, he had been a, a big brown, brownish, blackish one, and just every bit of ornery and mean as I've ever seen come out of what I've ever seen, just plain mean. But, I mean, I can imagine having my hand smashed from a door on a deuce and a half uh, i'd be pretty upset too so it, it is what it is you know i wish it would have it would have went different i wish maybe they would have just jumped in the back got the food throwing it out and we wouldn't have had to see none of them but they they made an appearance and it is what it is that's all i can say about that Vic. unfortunately you're right it is what it is and all you can do is just deal with it the best way you know how and I'm sorry to hear that so many people have laughed at you, Mo, when you tried to tell them about your encounter, but don't lose sight of the fact that every single last one of them would have had a spray and wash moment if they would have been there with you that night. Yeah, thank God for Kenny. Kenny was the one who told me. Kenny is a member of the Squatch Dogs, and he was the one who told me, because, I, Vic, I never knew about y'all. I never knew about your program. I didn't know nothing about nothing until he had mentioned this. And I said, uh, are you serious? You're kidding me. And then when he said, no, look up on YouTube. He said, look up on YouTube and look at what they got. And Vic, I swear the moment I opened that page, I said, that's it. That's the one right there. That is it right there. That's the one. And I tried to tell my son, we know, but well, we won't talk about him anymore. But but that, that was it, Vic. I knew that that these things had been around, and you know, and, and I should have took a uh, serious note when my cousins had told me about them, about the ones being up in uh, Austin, uh, uh, Gonzalez, because there there's a lot of them out in that neck of the woods, and also um, my friend Kenny also told me that there's a a majority of them that are in Louisiana and in Arkansas. These dog men that uh I, I didn't even know about at the time Vic I didn't I didn't take it uh uh that serious until Kenny had, had told me about him and 
and l- really just opened my my eyes up to this. And thank God he did, Vic. I, I tell you, when I first saw Vic, a thousand pounds came off my chest. I said, I am not alone. I am not alone. There is somebody else out there who are having encounters. It's just not me. It, it's just not me. It, I, I thought I was by myself. And and when I saw all these encounters that you had, there's like three or four hundred of them. I was like, oh my God, man, these are for real, mate. I wasn't dreaming. This wasn't a fantasy. You know, because me and my first sergeant, we went back time and time again to ask ourselves, what was this? We didn't understand at the time what, what had happened. Because we even spoke amongst ourselves in his office and we said, you know, did we see what we saw? Do you think we might have been smelling too much exhaust fumes or something? We saw what we saw. And I could remember, man, Vic, the size of that dog, that, that dog man's head, at least two feet long. It was from the front of the window all the way to the ears were to the back of the, of the window to the top. Just enormous. At least two and a half feet, his head. And I'm talking about the teeth on that thing. The teeth had to, from row, from the front canines to the back teeth, it had to have been at least 10 inches, just sideways, 10 to 11 inches. And just, man, clamping down like a meat cleaver, man. I swear. Uh, I'll never forget it, man. Never forget it. And, and, and thank, I, I really felt bad for my first sergeant because he was the one who took the brunt of that noise that noise that horn that 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 sound that 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 thing made big once once you hear that that noise you will never forget that noise ever that that noise it's it's welded in me Vic. that noise is is it it it, it nails it's like the nails on the coffin big it that it just scared you know I, scared the living out of me it it really did Rick. it scared it scared me to this day to this day you know you know and 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 thank god that that there is a show that you can at least get out there and and, and communicate and can and can tell you know your side of the story what had happened now i think i thank the military for what they did you know they cleaned it up and everything went um, honky dory as far as you know getting back to point a i guess you could say but it wasn't a a nice ordeal i could tell you that uh, i really wanted more answers and and they don't give answers they give orders and that's what they do so they give orders and i listen so that, i guess that's the best way that we can conjure up this whole scenario of it. Well, when it comes down to it, you had a really rough experience and you dealt with it the best way you knew how. So you deserve a lot of credit for that. Yes, sir, Vic. It was one crazy night. I can tell you that. I will never forget it. I know, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I should have kept up with my first argument, but unfortunately, you know, everybody goes their own ways. And uh, I know that Wherever he is, you know, may God bless him, and 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 I sure hope he he puts this whole uh, ordeal, you know, to rest, and hopefully that because I knew that he had had uh, some children that, uh, and I know that I, I was I was so young at the time. I was I had just turned eighteen. I was still a very young. I was so young and naive, and and just. Uh, wet behind the ears i was green greener than you call they used to call them greenhorns over here i was as green as you could get i mean uh, uh i didn't know um nothing from nothing i just knew that i took my orders and i did my job and and that's what i was supposed to do uh and and i did them you know uh but i'll tell you one thing i know that they're out there and all i can say is for a lot of these young fellas who think you can just go out there, you know, all I can say is if you're going to go out there and research, be a, do, 
justice, research. You know, if you're going to research, then be a researcher, you know, do your job diligently. Don't, don't go out there to hurt these things unless, you know, uh, and, and this is what I forgot also that this is what they, he told me this, this, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, he said, there are bad ones. He said, it's no different than a, than a family who has an uncle who, uh, goes, uh, astray you know he says sometimes you have a um, a son who will go uh on the on the wrong end and it's up to the alphas to take care of their pack you know because I, I i was asking a lot of questions and and he was gracious enough to, to to give me a little bit you know i asked and then i told him i said oh i wanted just a, a few answers and he was he was good enough to do that you know and and, and i thanked him for that but at the same time, uh, it is what it is, Vic. And, and, and if he says that they're out there for a reason, well, they're out there for a reason. I, I, don't, I don't know why, but I, I guess they're there for a reason. And it makes you really wonder what they're protecting us from. I don't know, Vic, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, they're there. Uh, he said, I don't want to get in, into any... Uh, crazy stories but he says they're there for a reason he says there are things out there that we can't take care of that they can and and that's about it and you won't get no more from me and that and i i don't know how much that meant or what that meant but it's always been a question in my mind and and i thought i'd just leave it at that and all these years you know big sometimes it's just best to to put it a put it aside I, i've tried my best to put it aside, to box it, you know, kind of like a Pandora's box and just keep it locked and don't open it. But I felt it was, it was time, you know, that I can come out and, and tell my little story, my little encounter and just get on with life. This was a very long time ago. This was almost 40 years ago. I'm 57 now. And this happened when I was, uh, uh, like I said, 18. I believe there was one of your, uh, there was an encounter where, uh, there was a, a young fella who was uh, in uh, uh, Marion, uh, Louisiana, that was real close to, I guess, to, not Shreveport, but uh, not Lake Charles, but New Orleans. And he was telling a story. And he he was also uh, in a situation where I guess he was on a, on a railroad track where I believe where him and a, a, a dog man had, uh, he had an encounter with these dog mans also. And I was thinking, I said, man, I said, Louisiana has a lot of these, must have a lot of, of these dog men that are around there. But uh, I met, it must be, I'm not going to say a, a hot spot or a hot bed for these things, but but I know, I don't know how long, when his uh, encounter was, but I know mine was in 1980. And uh, if if they're around uh, then, they, they're probably, they've been around forever. So... All I can say is, uh, if you're going to research, research, but don't, don't go out there to, to try to capture one or, or try to have, uh, you know, a picnic with one or a, a birthday party. No, these, these, these things are, these things are, 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 are beasts. These are, this is, these are not, this is not something you want to play with. That's all I can say about that, Vic. I don't have a, hate towards them i'm a city boy and 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 i belong in the city that's the way i want to that's where i want to stay and i'm okay with that Vic. um but if i ever should be a country boy well i know one thing i'm i'll be ready i won't i won't <laughs> i will not be in the same situation i was but like i said they will have to have crossed the line in order for me to uh to unleash any type of uh arsenal on them because you know the way I figure they have to eat you know and so do we but as long as they don't hurt my children or hurt none of my family well then so be it they can do what they got to do as long as they don't hurt my family or, or my you know my homestead uh, I'm okay with that until they start uh, going past that then then they have to be uh, taken care of. Well, I'm I'm sure the there are 
those, like I said, those men in black or whoever takes care of those cases now uh, do their job or remove them because uh, I guess that they were able to, because, oh, I forgot to mention this one thing, Vic. Uh, when I was with those those gentlemen, uh, I asked them, I said, is there any way that y'all can please give me my containers, my the containers that uh, that went back to the mess hall? I said, I signed for those. And and they they they, they did that they they went out there, uh, they got all my containers except for one. Uh, they didn't know where the other one was at, but uh, I got back I think five five or six of them. I don't I don't recall, but I got back enough of them where the mess sergeant was uh, okay with it. All the uh, I think there were uh, must have been I think fourteen of the inner pods, the inner aluminum pods that went in those containers that were missing but the mess sergeant was okay with that he said he could replace those so other than that everything was good to go a lot of things went wrong that night but also when you think about it a lot of things actually went right that could have gone wrong so it could have been worse you mentioned your cousins again about 10 minutes ago did you ever tell them about your encounter and if you did how'd they respond no no Vic I, I haven't had a chance to drive to drive up there uh but uh, when I do, when I do, I will make peace and I will say, you are so right. And I'm sorry that I did doubt word what you said. They have been, you know, to them, uh, that's that's just a part of life up there. Right? You know, to them, it's it, it's nothing uh, new. It's nothing to, it's just a part of life up there where they're at. But to a city boy like me, it's a big thing. Uh, uh, man, are you kidding me? He says, "Yeah." Uh, and and one of my one of my good cousins, his name is David. He's the one who told me. He says, "Yeah, most of these things been out here for forever." He says, "Uh," and then I have some uncles named Uncle Alvin. He said Uncle Alvin had a, a hard time with one of them one time, and uh, this was back, I believe, back in the the forties and uh, the fifties when uh, when they had their battles with them. And, and and at the time, you know, when they're they're trying to tell me this, uh, you know, it was I didn't think much nothing of it. I was that there was just like, oh, they're just telling stories, you know. I didn't think nothing of it at the time, but uh, I I ended up getting later uh, stationed in uh, Fort Hood after this whole uh, scenario. About a year later, I ended up getting stationed at Fort Hood, and uh, uh, I got to talking to my cousins that were that lived in, in Belton in Temple, Texas. And they were telling me, they said, Oh yeah, these things been around for such a long time. Oh, he said, it's really nothing to us. He says, but he says, you know, we don't hunt, uh, during the, at night. He says, if you do, he says, you've got to be tactically ready. He says, but, uh, we don't, he says, just best not to, if you're going to go deer hunt, it's best to do it during the day. You know? So I don't deer hunt. I don't hunt. I said, I don't even fish. I said, this, this, uh, what happened to me, Vic, had, had rocked me so hard that I have never, ever taken my children camping. Never, never will, never want to, don't want to, and, and don't care to. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just this set in that way. I will never do it. I will never put my babies and my children ever in harm's way ever like that i, I couldn't do that Vic. there's just no way there's no way I, I could do that because you know you could make the wrong move and 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 things could really get uh nasty out there you know and uh, that's the last thing i want to do is, is is remove something that isn't supposed to be removed from this earth if you're back into a corner you know you have to come out of there swinging but but if you don't then don't l l let them be and, and 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 get out of there but if, if if you're ever in a spot and 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 you should meet one that is rogue or one that's uh not all there in the head and i'm sure there there are dogmen out there that are that are a little uh not all in the head maybe from what you know that lieutenant colonel telling so there may be one that's uh inbreded 
that uh, Alf was having taken care of. But I, I don't want to ever be in that situation where where I have to to fight one. Uh, I couldn't do it. Right? I just don't, you know. Not that I wouldn't. Uh, not that I I couldn't uh, immobilize one because I sure have the artillery to do it. I mean, Vic, I mean, when I, I, after this incident, I think uh, I went out and I bought me a, I bought me the largest uh, um, sniper rifle there was. I bought me a Barrett 50. I bought me a Barrett 50 and I bought me the, uh, I bought me the, the, the best uh, uh, armored piercing rounds that could go in that thing. And, and I said, if I'm ever in that situation, I said, I, 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 at least I'll be ready. But if I don't have to use that gun, uh, then I then I, then there's no me there's no need in me bringing it out. So that's enough said about that, Vic. Yeah, if it comes to that, then you've already lost. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's good you understand that. If you were holding those talons in the palm of your hand right now, Mo, how would you describe them for us? Oh, Vic, one of them is sharp as a razor blade. They were sharp as a razor blade the one the one that i had uh you could you, you can you can cut a, a piece of paper and just slice it straight through the one that i had the longest one that i had you could slice the paper straight through okay it was as hard as i wouldn't say uh um you know i wouldn't say not ivory a little bit less uh um it was a little bit weaker than an ivory, but it was, it was still, it was still so sharp. The, the, the front of it was, was point was so pointy that you could easily step, you could easily prick yourself and, and, and it would, it would, it would make a, a, a blood spot on you. If you, if you were to stab your, say for instance, your arm and you poked at it, you are definitely going to have a spot there of blood coming back up. It was as sharp as a needle. There was no doubt about that. Now, the other two that had been broke, I didn't know if they had got damaged because of the door when maybe it slung them out and they broke and they were just pieces. But that long one, Vic, I guarantee you, it could, it could slice a piece of paper. I know because I did it. And I even showed a friend, I showed a couple friends of mine. I said, check this out. You know, and they asked me, you know, what is that? And they thought it was a piece of glass. I said, no, man. I said, that's what that, that's what that thing was that, that attacked me the other night. And then, you know, same thing again. Oh, you you know, yeah, you're just fooling. You're just telling stories. Okay, all right. But word got back. Word got back to the CO. The CO went and said, yeah, he's got him. Next thing I know, they rolled back up to me. <laughs> and that's okay. I knew what they were there for. And they said, are you sure this is all you got? Yes, sir. I said, he only broke three. I said, that was it. I said, if, I said, y'all should know. I said, if y'all immobilized him, I said, y'all should know. And I guess they didn't. I think, I don't know how they move these creatures, uh, Vic, but I know that they, that there's a way that they, uh, maybe they send some type of a, uh, like a sonar or, or something that, that irritates their their hearing like you do to a dog. Maybe it's some, something like that where they can move them out. Uh, but but I guess that, that was it. And come to think of it, Vic, you remember I was telling you at the beginning of the story when I saw those eight little lights over there that was by that first, the, the first, you know, from the very first time I saw that, the first one coming out when I thought it was a bull. Well, what it was, was, uh, that female that was running on the side of me, she had had a, a, a litter of uh, little dog men. And those were the little guys out there that were poking their heads up, looking at me as I was shining the light on them. That's how bright their eyes were. They were, they were like little, like little, almost like little flashlights. Now the one, the, the dog man to the, to the uh, left over here, the one that female, man, she had some gorgeous, just gorgeous amber eyes. They were just gorgeous, just big old gorgeous amber, beautiful eyes, big old amber. They weren't uh, brown; they were amber, the color amber. You know, 
and they weren't fluorescent or, or pop or anything like that. They were just a beautiful amber uh, eye, you know, both of them. And the way she shut them, Vic, was just so persuasive, you know, as you know, like like when a woman is trying to, uh, I wouldn't say seduce you, but when they give you that beautiful look, like like they're closing them very slow, you know, and she's trying to get to telling you something that that's exactly the the message that i got from her it, it's hard to describe but but that's what that's what i felt that she was telling me and and no sooner than i, I don't know maybe she might have had me in some type of hypnotic state as i was jamming them gears and uh I was really in some, uh, <laughs> it's kind of strange that I have to talk about that because usually what I would do is I would make sure that I would save a lot of sandwiches for a lot of the friends of mine that were in my own company. Well, I had those all stacked up to the corner right there. I had about probably about 25 sandwiches that were made with bread and pork chops and chicken that I was going to save for the guys the next day. But no, they made sure they got those too. I was saying. <laughs> They weren't, they were, they weren't, they weren't picky. They made sure they got everything. I can tell you that. They're thorough. So yeah, that comes as no surprise. Well, Mo, we're about out of time, but before we get out of here, if someone who had a bad encounter like yours is out there listening to tonight's show and is rattled to their core because of it, what words of wisdom would you share with them? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you know, Vic, uh, the good Lord that they can relieve tension, pressure, that they can take it all away, you know. Ask and 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 you shall receive, you know. That that's that's the really thing that 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 helped me. That that's the only thing that helped me. I had nobody to talk to to uh um Beck, I, I had nobody. No nobody understood this. As a matter of fact, I I went through this uh for years by myself. Uh, I had went through um, uh, some very tough times. Um, think ab about this, you know. There were times where, you know, um, alcohol I tried alcohol and, and and tried different things, but but you know what? And that wasn't the right remedy. I was going out the wrong way. When I found the good Lord, He took me right into His bosoms and just took care of me, right into His arms, and and. And the good thing about that, Vic, is, is the deeper you pray, the, the easier it is for those who 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 take uh, the other hand and 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 want to go battle. Well, that's also another way you can take care of it. But sometimes, uh, like I said, when me and my first son, we were just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, we and. We just happened to be on their territory when my first sergeant probably urinated on on that ground. Was, that was probably their area. I know that a lot of uh, dogs are very are like that. They have their own spots. I think that we when he flicked that cigarette and it and it kind of blew up at the end when it landed. I felt that that those dogmen felt that that they were going to be harmed by what they saw. You know, that's what I thought. I hope nobody ever goes after these things, you know, not as, and not for, uh, just to go out and hunt on. If you have vengeance on your mind, well, find, find some other way to take care of it. If you could, if they have hurt a family member of yours, if they've hurt, you know, and I've known the. I've heard a lot of people say that they that they've lost their pets and they've lost their their dogs, and and I understand that animals can be replaced. You know, and I and I don't mean to say it in a negative way. I, I don't. Uh, um, I know that we would fall in love so much with our with our our friends. You know, our 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 our, our animals, our our dogs. You know, and we love them so much. But but to go out and to fight something. Because if you go out there, Vic, if you go out there and you're and you get on their on their playground, you're going to be playing by their rules. That's so much I can tell you. You you will be playing on their home ground, and that's where they're going to have the advantage. 
You know, you can have a, a Barrett 50 and you can have a, a Creedmoor 6.5 and you can have the finest rifles out there. But you know what? Yeah, forgiveness, you know, uh, compassion. Uh, uh, it took me a long time to, 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 cause I, I, I wanted to go back and I wanted to do justice, but, but for what? No, there, there's no reason. Just let it go. And, uh, and just, you know, live to, live to talk about it and live to, uh, live another day. Vic. That's the best thing I could say. Well, those are great words of wisdom. Very well said. Well, Mo, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of that encounter with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Vic. Oh, you're welcome. I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dog meat encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.